I like the recording in progress. The lady just said that means that's us, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so, hello, everybody. I'm Terry McFadden, and welcome to Backstory, the interview series where we step back to go forward and perhaps learn some things about our guests we never knew, and maybe they didn't either. John Lair is a comedic actor, writer, producer, and show creator who works in film, television, and the theater. He is a sought after speaker, a lecturer, a comic, a stand up comic, a stand up guy, a podcaster, and a host. He, along with his creative partner, Nancy Howard, under the banner of Howler Monkey Productions, have created and produced three situation comedies that have run several seasons that being 10 Items or Less on TBS, Jailbait on Crackle, and my personal favorite, Quick Draw on Hulu. Love that show. They have also created pilots for Comedy Central, NBC, EEUE, Screen Gym, and Fox. John has hosted several shows on the E! Network, ABC, CBS, TBS, and, and ladies and gentlemen, John was the original Geico caveman. Let's give a warm backstory welcome for a guy that I call the easiest working man in show business. Oh, ouch. One of the coolest guys that I've ever met. Uh, welcome, right John. back at you, Terry. Good Thank to be you, John. here, man. Good to see you. I think John, that sounds so impressive. I, I'd like you to read that intro to me every single morning just to make me feel good about myself. I'll tell you what, I can do that. We'll put it on record. We'll have it on a loop and we'll have it going on in your house and perhaps in some uh, on the way down the stairs out to the car. You know what I mean? I'm do, I'm, I'll do a new coaching show. Yeah, it makes me feel so impressive. I feel like, wow, I've really done something with my life. You did do all of that, you know, and I, I witnessed some of that and watched some of those shows, you know, and it, yeah. it's very good. You know, John, you and I know each other for about 20 years or so. Holy shit. Yes, that is true. I remember when I met you, I was uh, we're going to an event in West Los Angeles with a friend of ours. His name was Dale. Right. Yep. And Dale said to me, you see that guy over there? His name is John. You should put him in your place. Right. <laughs> I walked over and I met you and you said, I would love to, but I'm in a series. Right. I'm a series regular right now on a show called Jesse. And I thought that was the coolest thing I ever saw, because you're like, you're doing a series regular, you know, you're doing and I, what I was trying, what I was trying to say was like, I am so overwhelmed right now. I can't, I don't even know what's, what's up, what's left or right. Oh, uh, yeah, that, good. Was, that was my first, uh, well, I did a show prior to that called News Weasels on, <laughs> e, which was a, as you can imagine, a terrible show. Um, it was, um, this was on E! Entertainment Television before it became the Kardashian channel. And okay. uh, it was uh, uh, it was a show, it, it had a great idea. It was like uh, two guys who make fun of the news, you know, kind of like, uh, I don't know, uh, okay. you know, Daily Show before the Daily Show, but not as smart as the Daily Show by any means. But um, it, it was my first, you know, job on a, you know, a regular on a, on a series and, I loved it. I was excited about it. And um, E bought the, uh, they, they, you, we needed news footage to make fun of and right. E screwed up and they paid like a million dollars for the NBC news feed, but they didn't realize that you have to pay the local affiliates as well. Ooh. And so we couldn't use any of it. And oh. so, we, so this was during OJ. That's how long ago this was. This was during there OJ. And, in, and instead of talking about OJ, we were talking about like public domain beer <laughs> in Australia because that's all they could afford. And, Me. and so, you know, the show lasted like a season and that was it. Season's good, but the white Bronco is going around the block. And in, in, uh, I, I remember watching that in, from yeah. Brentwood and everything. And, and uh, you guys were doing that. But I'll tell you, your, your career has been very broad and very rich from where you came from. I mean... Uh, you come from a small town in Kansas, right? Yeah. Well, my family, my extended family comes from a small town. Uh, my father moved a small town called El Dorado, not El Dorado, but El Dorado, okay. which is uh, uh, mispronounced outside of a uh, town outside of Wichita. And But my father moved to Kansas City to a, a, a suburb called Overland Park on the Kansas side. That's now pretty fancy. You know, we, you know, had a, you know, middle class, lower middle class 
upbringing and you know I, I didn't want for food or anything but uh i didn't we couldn't afford braces that's probably the best way i could describe my <laughs> that's know. pretty good i think that's in between uh working class and middle class because if yeah. you can afford once you can afford braces you're in the middle yeah when yeah. you get the braces when you get the braces you're in the middle uh yeah. but when you when you can't afford the braces then that's just a little bit lower but coming from kansas I, and you went to hollywood you know, yeah. like Dorothy and the tornado, right? Yeah. All of that. How long were you in Hollywood when you realized you're not in Kansas anymore? Oh, immediately. Uh, but I, but I, you know, I had a stop in between in Chicago. So I. Well, I that's I, right. I, you were at Steppenwolf. Yeah. No, I per, I performed at Steppenwolf, but I wasn't in their company. But okay. yes, I, I I performed at Steppenwolf. Amazing theater. Have you ever seen anything there? Yes. Only on only only the clips. I never attended in person, but you know, I did burn this, the, the play burned this, and I did the other one with the two brothers, uh Wild West, True West. Oh, True West, great. True play. West. I did a, a performance of that in Oh, uh, you'd be good in that. You'd I, be good. I, I, I was the bad guy, and then I and then I turned into the nerd, which you know it, it's extremely difficult, folks, for me to turn into a nerd. <laughs> but then I was yeah, I mean, it's an amazing theater if you can ever, if, and yeah, I was lucky enough to perform there uh, with an, in, a, in a kind of uh, an, an improv type show, but I hate to use that term because it's not, it wasn't like um, what you'd see at, at Second City, it was more um, theatrical, um, but yeah, it was, I mean, it was, Steppenwolf was amazing space, and Chicago changed my life, you know, I I, I, I got into Northwestern on scholarship and um, and then that opened up everything to me being in a big city. And I, I discovered improvisation and which just like, I couldn't believe that you could go up on stage and say whatever you wanted, you know, uh, and that, that changed me, you know, and then that led to, I was in an improv show uh, in Chicago at the organic uh, theater in Chicago that uh, we were discovered by a talent scout. I mean, out of, uh, from Fox, this beautiful ex model named Eve Zerley came backstage to us and started chatting us up. And, oh. and she was like, do you want to come and do a show, you know, a, a show in, uh, in Hollywood? And we were like, uh, yeah, because we were <laughs> totally broke and, you know, no health insurance and, you yeah. know, doing theater. We were, theater people in Chicago, you know, making no money and working during the day and partying until, you know, four zero. in the morning. And until zero o'clock at night. Yeah. And that's when I met you right around that time yeah. when I was doing that show, uh, the earlier, you know, before that. And, uh, um, and, and then we, so we flew out that they flew us out there. I mean, it's just crazy thinking back on it, but they flew us out there we did a showcase. We did one night, maybe it was, I think it was one show. We just did one show um, in LA. And um, out of that, we got signed by ICM and uh, Three Arts Entertainment with management firm. And then we ended up getting a holding deal. Uh, they, they don't really do those anymore, but no, a holding no, deal no. at uh, NBC with Jamie Tarsus, who passed right. away recently. And um, it was fifteen thousand dollars, and I was uh, on drugs at the time, so good. I had a fantastic couple of months, couple of good nights. Yeah, on that fifteen thousand, and then, then things started to, you know, the reality started to come in, and we we had just been, you know, we ended up parlaying all of that just into that show at E. So that's how far we kind of tumbled down, and then, uh, you know, then we were just flavor of the month, and then, and then the real work began uh the real work did begin but there's a couple of real strong points there that you hit upon first of all you talked about improv which you later would make a trademark of yours right yeah. you later yeah. would make then you talked about the the uh, improv group in northwest which was called meow theater right yeah yeah meow. yeah you were also at the same time speaking of cats and i have to bring this up because when i was reading about you i have to bring this up you're a big cat fan you were a cat ally the alley cat allies so yeah. you in essence john lair were doing <laughs> cat lives matter you know save the cat right along the same time the book was coming out <laughs> Uh, wow, you're way ahead of the political system by 18 years. God damn, if I'd only recognized it at the time, I could have somehow you, exploited it. Did you that. invent the internet? 
Damn it! I'm telling you. Yeah, the the cat thing, uh, the Alley Cat uh, is a great organization. Uh, my mother's best friend runs it. Uh, my mother's passed away now, but her friend uh, uh, runs it, and uh, I support it. You know, and I've done stuff, uh, charity stuff for them. I had a cat all through Chicago, my days in Chicago, and that, I brought that cat to LA. Man, that cat saw a lot of crazy shit. And then, uh, and then passed away. And now I'm a dog guy. I've got two dogs. And no more cats? Kids. No, because we live right by the, by Griffith Park and there's a lot of coyotes. And b because of the dogs, I couldn't keep the cat inside. So cats, cats don't, outdoor cats don't last long in my, in my hood. No. Uh, I remember once I went, I was going to a party. This was early on too. I was going to a party up in the hills in Hollywood and I saw a coyote just walking down the middle of the street with two cat legs sticking out its mouth. Just kind oh, of like, no. Yeah. Yo, what They're up? They're back. I've yeah. seen the Runyon Canyon. There's a lot of them up at Runyon Canyon. I used to bring my little dog kid up there. You have to yeah. be careful. Keep them close. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I haven't had a cat. I would love to. I, I love cats. I'm a big cat fan. Yeah. Yeah, and you're you're a pretty cool guy, but a lot of your shows you you do a lot a knockoff of a nerd sometime, right? Yeah, and look how yeah. cool you are now. Communication. So I love miscommunication is everything to me. I love things being misinterpreted or misunderstood, or you know, I just I love that, and um, so I like playing characters that misunderstand uh, people, you know, a lot, and and the, so those characters tend to be you know, likable, oblivious people, you know, so Leslie yeah. Poole, Leslie Poole. I watched the pilot again. I'll tell you what, that was one of the most creative characters that I've ever seen. I like Leslie Poole. Now I like quick draw a little bit better. Just yeah. I, it's my personal favorite because I was writing something at the time, how to make a great pilot and you were using all the conventions already. Nice. Know, in quick draw, you know, I probably still own you, Terry. Huh? Your own spin on everything, your own spin on on, on uh, taking the antiquated version of a cop and bringing it 100 years back, right? Yeah, yeah. that was the key uh, sort of hook of that show, was that it, you take CSI, but you put it in the 1800s, and you make it a pretentious dude who went to Harvard, who, like every Harvard graduate, loves to tell you he went to Harvard, or finds exactly. an excuse to tell you he went to Harvard. And uh, so he's coming, he's a know-it-all coming into town and, and, uh, and he's an idiot. He's just a, a complete, he's book smart, street dumb. And, but he has a saving grace. Yes. He has he's a super the best shot in the, West, in the West. Amazing shot. And great shot. He's a great shot. And it's of no, it's not of him. It's just a natural talent, but he's incredible shot. And that saves his butt. Really, is there a fearlessness about this character in his all and his dumbness? Yes, because he it's his intellect that makes him think he, he's impervious, he's so much smarter than everybody else. He's like the classic, uh, you know, uh, lib who is you know, who knows everything, you know, uh, the cartoon version of it. Of I'm you know, I'm I'm definitely uh on the left side of the political spectrum, but I'm talking about the people who are way out there and, 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 and just think they know everything, you know? And watching, yeah, right. watching those episodes. And then there's the, the bar girl who's kind of his girlfriend, but not really as she's popping everybody else in between. But as yeah. long as he, as long as he gets his time that's marked for him, he's okay. Yeah. You he know? pays for his relationship and he thinks there's something more like everybody, every guy who goes to a strip joint, and thinks that, you know, he's got a special connection with the stripper where the stripper's like, no, just pay and thank you. Yeah, they'll play along, but, you know, it's a business deal. It's a business deal for her. You know, I'm emotionally involved. But in the end, she kind of starts to turn a little bit over yeah. time. Yeah. And there's the cool side deputy guy, like the cool guy, you know what I mean? And and he's there and all the other characters. And then your buddy, the guy that's in all of your stuff, the real tall guy. Uh, Bob Clendenin, yeah. He's yeah. a character actor. He's, he's that, the undertaker. He's the undertaker, yeah. We created, we I, everything I do, I write something for him. Uh, only, not because uh, I, I like him as a friend, I do, but because I want to exploit his talent. 
He oh, always comes through. He's amazing. And he's just, when we're in the edit room and we're looking for a joke to end the scene on, we just go to his camera. <laughs> And he always delivers. Always. Yeah. You just so, go to his face. He can just come up with a look. Yeah. You know what I'd I mean? I'd love to say it's because, you know, we have this great friendship, which we do, but that's not why I do it. I do it because I would just want to make money off of it. Yeah. You know, I, I want to talk format. I want to talk craft for just a second there. All three of those shows that really did pretty well, you came up with the idea of inside the beat, I'm calling it as an analyst improv. Yes. Okay. That's now, right. You, you're structuring a scene, you're structuring beat by beat, you're structuring the act, yet inside of that, all the actors know where the scene has to go, but they can do whatever they want to pull a laugh, to pull you in, to get you to react like, like good fellas doing the uh, funny scene, but yeah. that's in every scene. Right, that's exactly right. The only thing I would say that may even surprise you is that none of the actors know where the scene is going, wow. except for me. So we, we will write a very detailed uh, script. I, I don't, did I ever send you any? I should send you one because you would, you would die over it because it's so, it's, it, they're like 30 pages, single space. They're all action slugs. Occasionally yeah. we throw in suggested dialogue, but that's not dialogue that would ever be uttered in the scene. No. It's just dialogue to keep the reader interested because the, the scripts are just for the executives to convince them. It's for the that money. We know what we're doing and to give us millions of dollars to shoot yeah. it and, and to give them notes. They can write notes and they can say, oh, he would never say this. And we're like, okay, because guess what? He's never going to say it anyway. Right. And so we, you know, take their notes. And, um, and then the, those scripts would also go to the crew. So the props, costume, uh, you know, all of those, so everybody would know what we're doing uh, generally. Um, and, the, and, and we broke the story very specifically because the thing we don't like about improv is when it loses its narrative. Like we feel like a strong story is super, super important. Um, and, and when you're on the hook for you know, lots of money, you, <laughs> you, know, you gotta come up with something in the end. Uh, but, the, the actors loved it because they would just show up, get in costume, get in makeup, show up on the set, no lines, not knowing anything. And That's then they would tell them, okay, you're upset because he was drunk last night and, and he made an ass out of himself. Good. Right. Now I would know what was supposed to happen because right. I had written the script. And the director would know what was going to happen. The crew would know, but the actors wouldn't. And sometimes that would bug them and they'd feel like kind of manipulated. And if they ever felt that, we would show them the script. Yeah. And then they would read the script. And they'd be like, you know what? I don't want to see the script anymore. I don't need to know. Yeah, because the, the our argument was, look, you're an amazing, gifted improviser. Okay. Let's have you do that. If yeah. we tell you where the script is going to go, you're going to try to help. All actors want to help. And you're going to try to tell the story. We don't want you to tell the story. If we wanted you to tell the story, we would have a writer's room and we'd all work out the story. We want you to be in the moment and have that playful energy that only comes from improv right. and to be able to, you know, give us, give us a, a vibe, a, a, a tone that you just can't get out of a writer's room. And, and, and sort of the way we described it is, this is a writer's room, you, yeah. you know, but you're in costume and we're gonna shoot it, <laughs> you know? So um, that, and then once the actors saw that, um, most of them didn't wanna know anyway. They were like, this is great, I don't care, this is yeah. fun. But those of them that were like, wait a minute, this feels like you're, uh, I don't feel right about this. We'd show them the script and then, 10 out of 10 times they'd be like okay i've read enough what i'm good i'm good i'm good whatever you say john let's rock and roll here well, you know I mean? it was trust they knew we had their back and we created an environment that was actor centric oh, it yeah. was all about making them feel totally comfortable because you know when you're making stuff up and, you know, a hundred crew people are looking at you and cameras are shooting you, you know, it's, it's, it, it can be a little freaky, you know, it's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's it, for actors that are used to 
memorizing lines. It's it's scary. And even for improvisers. Yeah, but they're not but, used to improvising in front of camera. There's another aspect to it too, though. The aspect of the, the thematic elements still worked in play. Like when I was watching a pilot, I'm thinking, okay, I know what his themes are. Coupling, togetherness, togetherness, coupling. Now they have to know that. They, in some fashion, when the Latino woman was talking to the, the rock and roll guy, or no, the, the, yeah. the, the Undertaker, and they oh, had, yeah. uh -huh. and then the, uh, the, the the girl, the checkout girl, and the rock and roll guy, and then you were messing around with the, your ex high school girlfriend. It's all about coupling. It's all about togetherness. And at the end, as you demonstrated, it's about the big big breakup. No, this is my store. Yes. After you came together, they well, have to. How do they know that without? They don't. We create a, 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 a situation where that has to be the end result. And, and, okay. and, and this is like, I mean, you know, I write scripted stuff too. And this is stuff that I've learned from you and other writers. If you create the tension and you create characters that are going to um, intersect right. on certain levels, then when you're writing the dialogue, it almost writes itself because... Yeah. They, you know, you know, everybody's points of view is in place. Everybody's to get is that their intentions are in place. Every, you know, the everything's there. So then, when you get to the dialogue, that's the the play part. So that's the same thing that's happening, but we're just doing it on the fly, and we're shooting it with three cameras, and we're doing fifteen minute takes that then we go back and cut it down to, you know, ninety seconds. <laughs> Phenomenal idea. I love the concept too. I always thought that Superstore stole that from you. Maybe. I mean, if so, that's, you know, that I, I'm honored, you know, you know that's great. Uh, because... But, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I feel like the best idea of the show was not where it was set, uh, although that was cool, you know, setting in a grocery store, but the best idea of the show was who these characters were, you know, and, yeah. and their backstories. That to me was like, what was, the store is just an excuse, like a playground, you know? Th that all came through too. That all came yeah. through. I mean, you, you could- Well, the great thing about that show was, uh, um, is that we couldn't afford to shut down a store, a foot, big grocery store like that. We didn't have the, uh, the budget. So we shot while the store was open. Great. So the store was open while we were shooting. And so a lot of the extras and shoppers that you see in the background real were people. real shoppers that were just in there. Real and people. I would occasionally go up and improvise with them. <laughs> that, And then we would pay them, you know, uh, for it if they wanted, you know, to do it. We'd be afterwards, the lawyer would come up and go, hey, do you want to be in the show? Sign here. We'll give you money. If not, we won't use it. Um, so some of the scenes with the... Uh, with the customers are real customers who just came in to get peanut butter. Very, very natural. I was saying, boy, these are so natural actors, you know what I mean? Give me my peanut butter and I'm going yeah. home. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with improv is it just allows actors to just work on character and who they are, you know, and that's all they've got. And, and um, the dialogue can't inform that. So they have to really dig into their creative space and, and get that information as a reflection from their partner. That's really what we're after oh, yeah. is like relationship based uh, improv. Yeah, I, I, I got that as well. I mean, I yeah. got that as well. Uh, I want to shift gears because I know our, our fans want to hear about this, this, and I know you know what I'm going to go, where I'm going with this. Tell me about the audition <laughs> for the Geico caveman. Okay. You were so, the caveman. I know. I'm one, there's three of us. I did more, most of the spots I did, like I did around uh, like 25 national campaigns. Right. So, which is just sick. And this was back before, now, uh, you know, commercials are all um, uh, non-union. They broke, they've pretty, they've pretty much broken the union commercials now. Uh, but this was prior to that. This is when you know, you could make good money doing it. So 25 is that's, just- That's, that's you know, good. Oh, it crazy. It, it never, it, once in a lifetime, crazy. And the way it started was I had worked with these directors on a short, I, I, they knew me, they knew my improv show. Uh, this is before 10 items. This is before I was able, but they knew that I was like an improv dude. And I did, I was doing this 
trio improv show that was like super fast and um, uh, really concerned with narrative. And it, it, was, it was kind of the lead up to what I did then on television. But <clears throat> so they, had, they were fans of that show. And they had asked me to come in and audition. I didn't know they'd asked me. I was just going in on a commercial audition. Right. Commercial auditions are ridiculous. You yeah. usually get the, the sides, the script, like when you get there, there's no preparation. You, you just, it's cattle call. You know, you're just yeah. mm, come through and then they, 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 you get it or you don't. You yeah. do thousands of them, maybe you get one or two. And uh, so I went in and I saw this. It was caveman. I was like, what? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so I just went in, I did the lines, and then they said, uh, you can improvise if you want. Ooh. I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah? yeah I want. And then I started to improvise, and I think that got me the role. And then I did the first one, and I had to do all these prosthetic things, which was so trippy and yeah. weird. Took a while and to get that shit on, right? It, yeah, it takes like three hours. Three hours. Yeah, it's not... You would think it's not a big deal. It's like, all right, you know, better than working in a factory, just glue shit on me for three hours. I'm getting paid. I mean, no problem. Yeah. But it turns out human beings don't like shit glued to their face. We just don't like it. And it, and it just works you in a way that you're, you can't believe. Like, and there's all kinds of examples of this, of like famous stars that have freaked out over, you know, getting prosthetics yeah. uh and, Lou and Ferrigno. Some people can handle it and some people can't and yeah. more people can't than can and even me like i was a the, the the makeup people were like wow you're pretty good with this stuff because i could do you know like a 15 hour day with the stuff on but it's like chinese water torture it just starts bugging you little Itching. by little yeah, and it's just it, glue, constant. They have to constantly put on more glue. It's just uh, sticky, wet, hairy. Smells. I mean, I'm. It, it's not a big deal. But after eight hours, yeah, and you're outside and you're sweating, and then it starts to kind of change you. And I like after like eight hours, I really had to go into like a private space and just be like. <laughs> making lots of money you're making lots of money <laughs> that's the second <laughs> affirmation going on the loop we're just put keep it together and it, it yeah it was it was it's a trippy uh it was kind of a spiritual experience really in a weird way and then of course it paid out the ass so what yeah. better combo can you get so yeah it's i'm the most famous guy you've never seen you know i don't know about that a lot of people have seen you but do you think they could get away with that today it's an allegory. It's an allegory. True. And it's, um, yeah, I don't know. That is a very good question. It's still very popular. I just did uh, an episode of a Fox show uh, as the caveman that's going to come out soon. But there you go. I, I can't say what it is, but because they made me sign a, a thing. But uh, yeah, it's still, when people hear that, it's always the headline for me, you know? People still and it's what 15 it's years 15, ago four, 14 years ago or something i mean it's crazy because the first one you were the boom guy you were the guy with yeah the that boom. was the very first spot and yeah. that i was shirtless you so had hair on the shirt hair hair all over me right and my daughter my baby daughter she was just born came to that shoot and she wasn't just born because she could say dad dad and I was in the full thing. And the only thing that's me are the are my eyes. Everything right. else, teeth, everything. And my wife, and we were a little nervous about my daughter seeing me, you know, oh, how yeah. she would react. And she looked right at me and went, dad, dad. She knew <laughs> right away, which really freaked me out. Oh, man. That's so cool. Yeah. That's so yeah. cool. I love that. And I they got some little frog doing it now or whatever. A yeah. cricket, a cricket or something. An English cricket. Yeah, Get cricket. out of here. Chameleon, the chameleon. Get out of here. No, he's great. He's yeah, great. He's, a nice, he's a nice guy and everything, but I think people miss the caveman. Yeah, I agree. Bring him back. Bring him back. I, I think we should bring you. Let's do it, Union. Bring the caveman back. John, you are like a busy guy too. You know what I mean? You do a podcast, right? You teach, you coach. I want to ask you about something that I read about you that I found funny, but I didn't get an explanation from it. When you were doing lectures, when you're on a lecture tour, right? You were doing lectures. You did a bit called the Lear 
curse. Now that wasn't just F word, F bombs and stuff, was it? No, it wasn't. It was, um, so I do, um, I did an off-Broadway show called A Series of Comedic Lectures, which okay. were six different one-man shows that I would do in repertory. And th so there were six 90-minute shows or between 60 and 90. Okay. And the conceit was I wanted to do, you know, a solo show, but I found uh, solo shows really pretentious. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to do it, but not be a dickhead and do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So we were trying to figure out a way to do that without it looking like either, you know, I'm sharing my shrink uh, stuff uh, or I'm auditioning for Saturday Night Live. We wanted to try to make it a piece of theater, but so the odd, less show offy. Right. And um, so we came up with this idea of like a, a lecture. So like a Buck, Buckminster Fuller is, a, I'm a huge fan of his. He was this crazy lecturer in the right. uh in in the 60s and he he very formal he'd wear a suit and he yeah. had the microphone with the string around you know and so we kind of based it on that so I'm this lecturer it's me but it's a version the lecture version of me okay. so it's kind of like you're going to a college class but in the end it's I, I, it gives me an opportunity. I'm proving something. I have a topic and I'm making a point. Like yeah. one of them was, uh, I talked about the similarities between uh, George Donner from the Donner Party, uh, right. this Bigfoot hunter who was a PhD who blew his entire career by following Big, uh, Bigfoot. And then when I was arrested on LSD, and I talked about the similarities and differences between the three of us and how all of us had made a series of bad choices. <laughs> so it's a little infotainment, but it's funny. Anyway, it, it, was, it was super fun to do. And I still do one now that's more focused on my sobriety. I've been sober for 25 years. So I do one that's that's kind of focused on that, but funny. It's definitely, it's not like a, you know, it's not a holier than thou show that I perform it. Uh, I've, I've got one coming up just now. Things are starting to open. I'm going to Atlanta in June. Whoa, Atlanta. That's pretty cool. Yeah, people are, things are coming back, you know. I think that's right. I remember your LSD story. You were out in the desert or somewhere, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I was in the, yeah. I was in, well, I was in uh, uh, Ojai. Yeah. Ojai. That's the, hiking. Kind of, yeah, hiking. Right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. You, you, it, it's very funny, some stuff that was going on. Yeah, I spent the night in jail on LSD, which is, you know, hilarious. Right. Uh, it was oh, hilarious. No, it was a terrible, horrible evening, but I, I uh, process things through comedy, so. Yeah, I thought that. Yeah, I thought that was a pretty good story. I mean, you could, you could. Imp that's not improvising. You could put that in there anytime. I, I have bullet points that I know. It's similar to what I do on the show. I know where I'm gonna go, but I, how I get there is different every time. And are you still, are you still like coaching people? Do you still have classes? Do you still, because you had here, here's something, folks, that I have to talk about that when I read about it, I said, this is probably one of the coolest things that I've seen. You used to go out to people's houses and do improvs for their house as long, ladies and gentlemen, as long as they made him dinner. Yes. It had to be yeah. Ganya, <laughs> I still do that. I'll do it. Car, right. <laughs> Tell, how, how do you go? Hey, I'll come okay. to your house if you make me a, some baked ziti. That was just something that I thought would be fun to do on social. So whenever I have a gig, so like, a, for example, this Atlanta gig, when that's a paid gig in a theater, before I go out there, I will post on my social media, hey, I'm coming to Atlanta. If anybody agrees to cook me dinner and let me and, and let us Facebook live it, I'll come to your house and perform in your living room for free. Good. Great. And it, it's hilarious, man. It's scary. I mean, a couple of times people are like, I can't believe you do that. You know, but you know what? People are good. That's the bottom line. People yeah, are good. And, I mean, that's risky stuff too, John. That's risky there stuff. There was one that got a little scary. One of them got a little scary. It was a couple that picked me up at my hotel. And I thought I, we, I was in Boston and I thought we were going to do it in Boston. And they just kept driving and driving and driving. Right. And I was like, oh shit, where the fuck are we going? <laughs> It was this old house that was like peeling paint <laughs> and stuff. And I was just like, what have you, you fucking idiot. 
John. And uh, and then I went in and it was awesome. They made What's me cool. both. It was amazing, amazing night. So they made you the big CD. So what else do you got going on? And what's going on in Atlanta? Can we hear about it? Can we go? Can we podcast it? Can we Facebook this it? Time, it's, it? A, it's a um, it, it's it's a charity event for the Karen uh, Recovery Center, which is a a non for profit uh, that has recovery centers up and down the East Coast. They're, yeah, they've been them. around forever. They started in Philly. Yeah, I know. Uh, them. Yeah. You may have heard of them. Um, they're an amazing organization, and so I'm just doing a fundraiser for them. But I'll post it. Um, I think outside people can come. I don't know. Some of them, sometimes they, it, people can, and sometimes people can't, but I love doing those because it's a combination of rich people. They're trying to get money from, and then all of my people, you know, who are recovering that are in the room. So there's, it's this great combination of like, <laughs> it's just awesome. It's an awesome experience. That sounds like a pretty good gig. I mean, that sounds, yeah. sounds like it would be something that I would enjoy to go to. And you, are you still coaching people? Do you still offer classes? Do you have time yeah, for any of that? I, I do, you know, because it's, you know, everything's been Zoom. But yeah, I do one-on-one. -on -one. Mostly what I do is people who want to pitch something because I pitch a lot. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, people don't pitch. A, a lot of people haven't had that experience. Don't know. They don't even know how it works or what, you know. And so I do a lot of pitching, uh, coaching, like, uh, first of all, just giving them the lay of the land of how you actually can get into a room and how it actually works and the best ways to do that. Um, and then it, once they get there, then, then I, I help them break a pitch and how, how you should do it and how I've done it and how I've sold things. Um, because it's kind of a gray area that a lot of people don't experience you know and i realized that uh because i i pitched a lot <laughs> so uh, i know i know how to, i'm basically a salesman terry that's basically i know you do you had about six or seven years ago i was setting up some pitches for myself and everything and i looked at your site and you you first of all you like to spoof a lot of things and i love that about you you, you spoof everything but you had i think 64 episodes how to turn a show how to make a show a show <clears throat> And yeah, all that that was um, that you're talking about how to sell a TV show, which was yeah. a, like a 60 episode thing. That is what we decided to do is we said, Lost OK, we're going to sell a, a TV show in 60 days or we're going to commit suicide. That was okay, good. That's TV. some stakes. There's some stakes. Yeah. Now we now we got some stakes going into structure. <laughs> so we shot like a, you know, two minutes, five minutes, whatever was happening that day through those 60 days. And we ended up selling the show on the, like the, we sold a show, a pitch to NBC. We sold it on the 62nd day or something wow. like that. So we did a false murder suicide kind of thing that was really funny. And then we sold them, but we were sneaking our phones into pitch rooms and stuff. Yeah. And uh, word kind of got out because it's kind of an inside thing. And so we would come in to pitch something and the executives would be like, are we on the show? Is this, <laughs> we, you know? right. and uh, it was fun. It was really fun. But yeah, we, um, yeah, that, it's so funny because that stuff, you know, once you post something, it's out there forever. And I still get people and I either get people who are like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. This is so funny and informative. Or I get people going, what the fuck is this? This is, I'm, I want to learn how to sell a TV show. And I'm, you know, I write them back. I'm like, have you watched this? Because this, it, 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 you know. It's I very it's, informative. It's and, and what you're doing, you know, because I'm an analyst. And what I see, I see not only you tell them how to TV show, but you're showing them how you would do it, how yours is different, how you got your own different voice, how anybody watching that's going to say, this guy's not going to A, B, C, D, E. He got a cool show. He got a cool spin. Let's buy it, which is your history. Right. And I think what also that that did, it, it, which is an adjacent to what you're talking about, is it shows the psychological that you go through pitching a show because it's your baby and now you're moving into sales. You know, you're an artist, but now you have to sell it. And it's, yes. a, it's a, it, oh, and the rejection and it's just a horrible way to make a living. And so we sort of um, chronicled that, you know. I think you did a good job. And we're going to ask, 
allow them to have a couple of questions. People may have a question here in a moment or so, John, but before they do, I just want to know if anybody needed to get in contact with you or can they get through your website or yeah. is there anything? How can the anybody- is best, uh, johnlear.com, J-O-H-N-L-E-H-R.com. Uh, and it's, uh, or uh, Facebook, I'm, I'm pretty responsive. Uh, and the, the contact info at the website I'm, uh, goes right to my email, so. That's good. It's, it's, I, I, mean, I could I could talk to you all day. It's 45 minutes in. We're 45 minutes in and I could talk to you all day because it's so interesting. I'd like to, I know that we have some TV people here that may want to ask you a question and because and, they're working on projects. So yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let's do a little question and answer here. Who may, who may have a question first, please unmute and open up. I do. Is that Kate? Hi, Katie. Hi, Carrie. Okay. Thank you so much for the invite. And John, it's, it's great to get to know you. And uh, congratulations on your sobriety. Thank I you. like your birth date. I got sober on your birthday in 1991. Nice. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm part of that group. That's, that's yeah. long term. I, I'm glad I'm glad you're here today because um, I just needed something to kind of reinvigorate me. I'm really a singer songwriter. I moved to LA and moved to Squim, Washington, which is famous for the 90 day fiance um, <laughs> guy. So everyone knows where I live. But my dad passed away last year from Alzheimer's. And so I was caring for him. Yeah. He left me some money. So I started taking some sync film and music writing classes. But I really want to know in all your journey, um, what do you love to do the most when you're not working? Oh, when I'm not working, uh, I, uh, that's a very good question because, you know, you got to have a hobby. You've got to have an outlet, um, outside of it. I, and I love working on my house. I love, um, reading and, but most, most of my time for the past 15 years is about my kids. I'm just, I'm way into my kids. I'm way into being a dad. So, um, yeah, but I exercise, I run, um and uh that that's that's been really helpful i meditate uh but as far as hobbies go i guess i'm an avid football fan too which is ridiculous but i am and uh and i read a ton wonderful wonderful i just i i i love this whole thing your thing about exploiting people's talent <laughs> uh the improv, the improv within a I mean, Terry knows I, I was in a few of his plays and, and she's, just, she's that's good how I got to and um, it's, so it's just wonderful to be here and, and I just feel like I'm on fire. And then I definitely will contact you. I want to get to know more about the Karen Foundation and all that. So yeah, they're C-A-R-O-N. They're amazing. They're just an amazing group. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. My Thanks for coming on, Kate. I will say Kate is a pretty good actor. She owns the stage. She played a psychiatrist in one of my plays. She was very good. I was being awesome. examined. Very nice work. Yeah. Very good I, lo work. I love Terry's work, so. Thank you. Love your work too, brother. <laughs> who, who else would have a question here? Steve, you had a question. Yeah, I actually have a, a statement first. First of all, I'm... I'm <laughs> You know, John, that guy sitting next to you, I kind—I don't know if he's on your left or your right. Uh, him and I go back a long way. Yeah, well, that guy. <laughs> oh, I, I think he's to your left. But anyway, I mean, we go back a long ways. And I just want to say that I'm, uh, I'm really proud of him for what he's done and what he's doing. Thank uh, you, Steve. He, he certainly uh, has helped me, you know, in the screenwriting process. Same here. He's such a great teacher. Absolutely. And I don't know if you've read the book, what's the book? And he's a good bartender, too. Yeah, the what's the booklet that you just put out, Terry? The book is, uh, that sounds like me. Yes. Oh, that I, sounds if like you me. haven't read that, I, I just think that I've recommended that to so many people. I just think it's amazing. Oh, thank uh, you. I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Gets right I, I have me. a funny story about him. If he, I hope he... Thank uh, you. Well, years ago, when we were pounding the streets of uh, New York, he, uh, it's an I don't know if it was uh, All My Children or one, one of the soaps that we used to try to get on desperately. And uh, I think he got his first speaking part and we're all sitting around waiting for it to watch it. And unfortunately, our mayor died and the whole the whole episode was. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Philadelphia. Oh, got interrupted. Fuck. Got interrupted by the death of a mayor. Philadelphia. Oh my God. But anyway, John, I had a question for you. In in all the time you've done uh, improv, have you ever been? Uh, I don't know. Stump is the right word, or something came out of somebody's mouth that you had to react to, and you were like, "What?" I don't know. <laughs> and if you have, what do you do? I, I embrace it. You know, yeah. the, it, it, to me, like what improv is about is about the abyss. You know, it's about the not knowing and the yeah. it's a it's it's sort of um, it's related to my my addiction issues. It's it's about oh, okay. um, being out of control. And um, I, I search the not knowing a, instead of searching the knowing. So okay. I'm a different type of improviser. I, I try to guide scenes towards places where we don't know what we're doing rather than towards places where we would be able to, where, you know, I'm not a yes and guy. I'm a no but. I'm a, I'm a question <laughs> asker. I don't do any of those things. If somebody says something stupid, I'm like, no, I'm not doing, you know, I'm like if we're <laughs> and, the, and my partner is saying, hey, we're in an anus. I'm like, no, we're not. No, we're not. We're not in an anus. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. And if somebody, and and so for people who are trained to improvise uh, in, in sort of the modern sort of training that's kind of happened since the 90s of like, where it's kind of been more mainstreamed and it's like, hey, here's a way for everyone to improvise. Right. Uh, you say yes and, you don't ask questions. You know, there's certain tricks that you do that will give you a better chance of having a quote successful scene. I, I don't play that way at okay. all. I'm much more, I, I'm much more about free jazz than I am about being in a combo, if that makes any sense, you know? So I love the, Fear. I love fear. Um, who who would you say, besides yourself, who's absolutely great at it? Are you allowed to say? Or oh you, God, you, yeah. People, uh, yeah. So many people that I. I mean, I people that I haven't worked with, I don't know because right, you right. know, like for example, they say, "Oh, uh, the Office is improvised," and Rain Wilson's this amazing improviser. Well, I hear that they just go long on takes. And to yeah. me, that's, you know, that's great. That's a great thing. That's not where I'm, what I'm after. I'm after, you know, this, this kind of terrifying, free falling, you know, uh, mm -hmm. place. The, pe the best improvisers I've worked with, I mean, Bob Clinton and I would definitely put way up there. Carlos Jaycott, uh, Lauren Katz, um, these are probably people you haven't heard of because they're the people that I embrace are people who are <laughs> not yes. Uh, and you know, you know, who was one of the most amazing people I ever worked with is the guy who does the uh, Dan Castellaneta who oh. does the voice of Homer Simpson. Oh, sure. oh yeah. yeah. We had him on quick draw and he was improvising Bible verses. Oh my and, God. Uh, I had never. Oh my God. I had never seen, I was just awed by him. And, and yeah, he was one, those kinds of people who improvise in a way where I've never seen Wait. anybody like it before. I'm just like gushing, wow. but um, yeah, anybody who isn't trying to show off or, uh, or show me how smart they are, I'm a fan of, you know, if you're, okay. if you're just authentically with me, I'm I'm good, you know. I'm doing what I want to do, you know. Sure. I mean, I I've taken a few improv classes, and that's that. Uh, what you just said seems to be uh, happening in a lot of times that I was there. Like, all right, dude, I know you're funny, but I I just don't get what's coming out of your mouth. <laughs> and yeah, I would say and, that I don't get there. it. <laughs> go there. I don't understand. You know, that's my advice. Just go where you are going, and 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 try and and. Sure. Let it go. Let it rip. Yeah. I, I remember one time he was trying to do something and I, and I was stumped. And I think I may have farted. You know? <laughs> That's good. And I was, was like, in the moment. It's in the moment. It's over. Perfect. <laughs> God was on your side. There you oh, go. It was funny. It, it there was you go. Yeah. 
I, I think there's a little too much concern with good scenes and where things are going and establishing. I hear the that game. over and over. We got to establish who we are and what our names are and where we are. Okay, yeah, that's important, but that's not to me. That's like down on the list. That's like yes, okay. Sir. Yeah, yeah let's put periods at the end of our sentences. Sure, let's you know do a spell check, but <laughs> that, ain't, that ain't what I'm after. Look at the old timers like Don Rickles or people that went up from the oh seat of their pants. They knew nothing. They just went off of uh, the the element right there. Talk about playing off behavior. That's the main idea, anyways, to play off behavior. Yeah, and I'm I'm always in good shape if I'm concerned about the other, if about my player. If I'm oh, yeah. just, if I'm creating a space for them to feel comfortable, if I sense any fear in them, if I sense any discomfort, um, if my Use focus is on them, then I'm home free. You know. Yeah. One of the funniest things I seen, I I think it may have been Letterman, and um, they were talking about Dom Rickles, and they did like a top 10 list of Don Rickles jokes that don't make sense. And the more they played it, the more people just started laughing. Right. And they went nowhere. They went absolutely, like, where did that come from? Yeah. Monkey on a rock. A monkey yeah. on a rock. Oh, that's my the God. Absurd, the God. absurd, the unexplainable, that's that's my favorite. That's right. My favorite. But thank you very much for taking yeah. the time out. Good. Thanks, you. Steve. Good to see you, buddy. Brandon uh, Cherries is a friend of mine. Yeah, he's, go. he's, he's a good, a good man. He used to have hair, too. <laughs> <laughs> and how many times a day I hear uh, Kojak? Um, uh, it, it's all bull jokes. Stop, hi stop hanging cool. around with old guys. Go hang out with younger people. You won't hear Kojak anymore. Well, that, that's, why I, like, I started, <laughs> that's why I started writing, because somebody said I got a face for radio. And I figured, well, I think... Uh, you know, but anyway, you, thank you very much, my friend. You got a thank good you. script. Anton, we have Anton Hill. Anton, please tell us your question. Hey, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Hey, John. Um, hey. I, I apologize. I had to step away for a second, so you might have already covered this. Um, but a little tiny bit of background. I was actually at Hulu for five and a half years, and I think I was there... I think Quick Draw was still on. I think it was its second season. Nice. And I'm... Uh, I'm really, really curious about your process of getting the show there because when I started there was when um, I think Greg, no, Craig, sorry. I think Craig had just been hired. And I think my second, I was like nine months into my tenure when uh, Beatrice, who's since gone on to NBC, was hired. Yeah. And I, I didn't really know Beatrice well because I, 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 mean, I don't know how much you were aware of the, the actual corporate environment, but it was... The advertising was that anybody can talk to anybody, even the CEO. And to some degree, it was true. But to some degree, it was like, well, that's, yeah, okay. But in the degree that it was true, I got to have a couple of conversations with Beatrice. I got to have a lot with Craig. And so I got a little insight into how the originals team and system worked. Um, so I was just curious because to some degree, it sounded like any other studio. People came in and pitched stuff and you know, they went through the agencies, they went through the management companies, all exactly the same as anyone would expect. Um, but what I wanted to know, especially because I, I, I saw the quick draw poster everywhere in the offices, I was just curious, what was your journey in getting to Hulu? Who did you talk to? I, and obviously, as much as you can say, I, I don't want you to feel like you have to out anybody who need because I, I I am aware that the the woman whose name I forget who had been hired to run originals like left slash was fired and that's why they brought in Beatrice so I, I'm aware of a lot of that stuff and I don't expect any dirt I'm just very curious about the process you faced no no that's that's uh that's okay yeah no we the way we got into Hulu was 10 items or less which we did for TBS the store the grocery store show uh was on Hulu the reruns were on Hulu and it was getting good numbers and so Hulu called us in and said uh, you know, do you have, do you have anything that you, <laughs> we'd like to work with you guys. And, and we had been toying around with this Western, uh, mm. idea. I, and, uh, we, I, it had started with a Donner party. I mentioned that I, I was kind of uh, fascinated with the Donner party on, in my lectures. And I kind of wanted to do a Donner party, uh, comedy, a movie. Right. And, um, and so, but that got, that, that it didn't pan out. 
so uh, we, we we started talking about Western and, you know, I'm from Kansas. I grew up watching Westerns and I, and I thought that that would be, and I, I loved Monty Python. So historical Ooh. comedy was like yeah. something I really wanted to do. And we pitched it and we got it in. Now, Craig, Craig and Beatrice were the ones who canceled the show. Uh, okay. <laughs> Oh, so, well, I, 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 I hope you like the salt really that well. I just poured in your wounds. <laughs> um, you know, when they were brought in when Hulu, we, we were in the early days of Hulu when it was kind of right. growing and starting. And then those guys came in when they, when Hulu went kind of big tentpole shows. And, right. and right. so, uh, you know, a show like ours, which was not a big tentpole, it had a really hardcore following but it was right. not in fact i hear it still does really well on hulu um but we were you know we were not what they what the new regime was looking for we were a niche comedy show and they were looking for big big time stuff yeah i remember when uh, handmaid's tale was announced yeah. internally and um and i was like oh this this is going to be the next several years this yeah. this will define us as the the kids say as a brand yeah it, it, comedy listen comedy takes a certain kind of executive yeah and it takes an executive that's willing you know jamie tarsus was like a, the perfect example of an executive that understood what it took to get something because you look at like the best in the biggest comedies they all scored badly and did badly when they first started. Comedies tend to do that, you know, really good ones. You know, look at Seinfeld. Oh, Seinfeld yeah. almost got canceled multiple times. The only way it got on the air was through the specials department. If you, it is just, it, it was, it tested horribly. Same with friends, same with, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, many of them. So it takes a very special um, uh, uh, executive to stick with them, you know. And 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 Hulu was not there then, you know. Yeah, the impression I had at the time was that because uh, I I got in right at the end of Hulu being this this scrappy startup, and within I think nine months of my first being there, all of these huge announcements were made, and yeah. suddenly Hulu was a player and they both acted like and were treated as such yeah. and i remember you know smart move. i think it was the smart move for them they had to they had to right go. right no I, I i think it was too i just remember like we we would see basically i guess what are called upfronts but it was internal and you know there were some really big names who came in and it was like and i remember i had several friends who hit me up for jobs and i was like look we're hanging with jj abrams yeah. like you know, I, I, I don't control this, but that's what we're doing now. And so, like, unless you are able to play in that football field, then, like, just, just like, like I said, I, I got in the very tail end of it being a startup. So I don't even think I would have been hired maybe six months after I was hired yeah. because I, I saw people with pretty amazing resumes who couldn't even get a call back. So, um, but I, I was actually curious um, about the specific process that you went through was it just you you straight up you were invited in you pitched it and they said okay you know here's a bunch of money go make it and then well, that was they, it they we came in and no it was a longer process than that it always is but we went in and pitched it uh they said hey we're really interested in this but we need you to pitch out the entire season give oh, us a fine. season budget give us a season production schedule oh wow and then, okay. and a full pilot and then we'll take that and let you know if we're going to pick it up. And we were like, fuck that. Yeah. Uh, that's so much work for no on spec. Yeah. Oh, this is on spec. And they said to us, well, uh, <laughs> if you do it, we're going to pick it up. Okay. And said, okay. We'll do there it. There you go. Did it and they picked us up. That's enough. Harry, I'm getting called by my daughter to go. Okay, to so we're going to thank John for, for yeah. having yeah. John. Thank you, thank you, sir. And for coming thank to you, see us John. and everything. And his daughter was here. Appreciate and, uh, you. Thank you, Kim. Oh, thank you, guys. Thank you I'd like to much. thank you, John. I uh, thank you so much. If you could say something to your younger self, what would it be? <laughs> um, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> thank Brilliant. you so much, John. Thank, thank you for you. coming here for being on episode two. It's a pleasure to have you, Barry. Anytime. I love you. I support you, dude. I'm your buddy. Give me a call. We'll talk again. Thank you so much, everybody, for showing up. And I'm going to end the recording and 
hit your Facebooks. So keep your Facebooks happening. <laughs> Thanks, Anton. See Bye, you guys. everybody. Bye, Bye Terry. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, John. Be Most appreciated. Most everybody. appreciated, buddy. Most okay. appreciated. No problem. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.